I want to learn a little bit uh, about all of us because there's a bunch of different types of people in this room. But if you have a cell phone, um, you're one of a couple people. When you get a phone call and that number is a number you don't recognize, it doesn't pop up with a name, it pops up with a number. Uh, there are some people in this room that you will screen the call by hitting decline. There are some of you that will just let it go to voicemail. And then there's some of you that are so wild and so crazy that you actually answer it. So uh, I want to know uh, what kind of a person you are. So how many of you screen your calls? If it's a number you don't recognize, you do not answer. Raise your hand. All right. Most people in this room, how many of you you're the wild ones. How many of you answer the call just because you're curious? You want to see who it is. All right. Uh, congratulations. You're crazy. All right. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I'm one of those that I have a tendency to screen calls. I don't like, I don't like uh, uh, robocalls, all that kind of stuff. So I have a tendency to screen calls. But whatever type of person you are, I want to tell you this. There are certain times in your life that you need to answer the call no matter what. I want to give you an example. There was a, a guy who went on a hike at the tallest mountain in Colorado, Mount Elbert, 14,439 feet. And this hike he was going to take was supposed to take him seven hours. So he left at 9 a.m., went on this hike. And at 8 p.m., he had a friend that knew he had been gone and he had not returned. And so that friend became extremely concerned that after 11 hours, he hadn't come back yet from a seven-hour hike. And so the friend called up to Lake County Search and Rescue and said, hey, I've got a friend that I think is missing. I know the hike he went on. I know where he was supposed to go. He has not returned. Can you send people out to go look for him? So the Lake County Search and Rescue, they uh, they decided that they were going to send some people out. They sent out a search party and that search party was searching until three in the morning. And then they called off the search and said, we're going to pick it up again tomorrow. Then the next morning they re resumed the search and eventually he was found and uh, he ended up being, he was good. They took care of him, rescued, safe, all the things. But as a part of it, they put out a statement. They were talking about it, but they said that while they were doing the search and rescue, even though it's the tallest mountain in Colorado, they said this entire mountain has good cell service. And so one of the things we did was they said, we called his number over and over again while we were searching for him and it was ringing. But here's what they said. In their note, they said, one notable takeaway is that the subject ignored repeated phone calls from us because they didn't recognize the number. <laughs> There's search and rescue out looking for him. He sees a number and he knows he's lost, but he doesn't answer the call. I just want to tell you, if you're lost, answer the call. <laughs> All right, answer the call. We're glad he was found. He was lost and then he was found, but answer the call. Today, we're going to look at some things that were lost and found. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 15. As we continue in our parables, we talk about the need that we have to change, and, and all of us have a need to change. There are things that we need to change, and as we look at the parables, there, it shows us some things in our own hearts, and our own lives. It's, it's a mirror that kind of shows us some things in our lives that need to change. It's also a window that which, with, through which we can see the world. It's like a set of lenses that we can see the world. And so these things today, as we look at it, we want to ask the question, God, what would you have me to change? What do I need to change in my life? So Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. He actually tells three parables. We're going to talk today about the first two. Next week, we'll pick up on the third one. It says, Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you, or some of your translation says a shepherd, has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Now, I want to point out the first three things that we see are all right here in this verse. The first thing we see is we see the shepherd. There's somebody who has sheep, a shepherd who has sheep. And then the second thing, obviously, because we have a shepherd, we have the sheep. But we also don't just have the sheep. We have a sheep that gets lost. There's 99 sheep that are there, but one was lost. So there's 100 total sheep. One goes Missing. So we have this lost sheep that was lost from the shepherd. It wasn't, the idea was that it wandered away. It wasn't because of the shepherd. It was because of the sheep had wandered away. Now we talked last, I guess it was last spring, the end of last spring about Psalm 23 and how often in scripture we're compared to sheep and sheep wander a whole lot. That's one of the things that they do. They're not extremely bright. They're not very intelligent, but they wander a whole lot. Well, this sheep had gotten lost. And so what happened because this sheep had gotten lost, were compared to the sheep. 
In this parable, we're going we're to see how we're a part of this, that we're being compared to the sheep. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 says, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. How many of us have done that? All of us. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray or have strayed away. And we have left, all of us have left God's path. We've wandered off in our own direction. And this is the idea that all of us are lost at some point in our lives. Now, you might say I'm found, but all of us have been lost. But here's the thing. When a sheep gets lost, a lot of times they don't know they're lost because sheep just wander. And I don't know what your story's like in your own life, but a lot of people go through life without even realizing they're lost, never even realizing or feeling like they're lost. And sheep don't have good, good navigation skills, so oftentimes they can't make their way back. So they have to go be found. And because of that, they're helpless without a shepherd. And so we have the shepherd, we have the sheep that gets lost, and then we have what happens in this verse, the search. The shepherd says, I want to go and I want to search for this sheep. Now, you may look at this and say, well, the shepherd had 100 sheep and only one was lost. Why would he leave the 99 to go after the one? I want you to understand something. This is the point of these parables that we're going to be looking at. Exactly this is the point. You might be thinking from a business standpoint, you're like, a 1% loss is not worth leaving the 99 to go gather that one. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of effort. But here's what Jesus is trying to say. He's trying to show the people when he's telling this parable that that one sheep is valuable. You might say, I've got 99 more, but he says that one still matters. That one still has value. No matter what, I want you to know that you are valuable. If you've ever felt lost in the midst of a room of people, if you've ever felt lost in the middle of this world, maybe you look and you've been like, God, I know that I've made a lot of mistakes and I've done a lot of dumb stuff. And I know there's a lot of people that you have to worry about. God, I, I, I know that you probably don't even care about me. Or maybe you just don't even talk to God about it. Maybe you just feel that way. You feel like somehow you're lost in the shuffle, that somehow God has forgotten about you. This is the point of what Jesus is saying, that you are valued, you are valuable, and he is on a search for you because you are pursued by the shepherd. Now, I want to ask a question. As you look at that verse, how long did he pursue the sheep? How long? It says he went after the sheep, and it says until he finds it. That's how long he's coming after you. So I want you to know that if you're lost today, whether you realized it before today or not, he's still coming after you. He is coming after you all the time. He goes after his sheep until he finds them because they are valuable. I want you to know today, if you didn't feel like you were valuable, I want you to know you're valuable today. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, no matter what's happened to you, no matter anything that's happened in your life, I want you to know today you're valuable. You are valued by the shepherd. So the shepherd pursues and then the shepherd rescues. And then we see, first we see the, the shepherd, then we see the sheep, then we see the search. And you got to hang with me here. But the last one is the celebration. Now, uh, I, I know it's not good alliteration. Uh, still has the same sound, the S sound. But here's what I want to say. At, at one point, I was like, I can't find a better word that makes sense here. And at first I was like, you know what, we'll just spell it with an S. And I thought, I can't handle that. They, there's going to be people in the room that can't handle it. But here's what's going to happen. I'll just say this. You'll remember this because there's going to be a time you're going to read this and you're going to be like, there's the shepherd, there's the sheep, there's, there's the search. And you're like, and that dumb guy, there's the celebration. And you're going to think about this. All right. So here's the thing. We got the celebration. Verse five, it says, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Then he goes home and he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, he has joy. He says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, this is Jesus speaking, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And we're going to see kind of the bigger picture of this here in just a moment. But here's the idea. Jesus says that when one is brought home, there's rejoicing in heaven. The shepherd has joy and there's rejoicing in heaven. You know, when we baptize, we talk about this a lot. You and I, I mean, we, may, we may not get to see the people that give their lives to Jesus, that, whose lives are changed, whose eternities are changed. We might not get to see it, but this is the celebration, right? The shepherd brings home the sheep and all the neighbors might not have seen it. But the shepherd says, hey, I want all of you to come see that the sheep that was lost has now been found. And that's what baptism is. This is the picture. That's why we celebrate. That's why we don't just go, 
Cool. We celebrate. You'll hear people shouting. You'll hear people saying, yeah, woo, whatever it might be. It's a celebration. I want us to continue to learn how to celebrate even more when that happens, because this is the moment where we say, you know what? We might not have seen when it happened, but we get to celebrate that someone was lost and is now found. There's rejoicing in heaven. So when we do that, we join in with heaven to rejoice. I just want to remind you of that. It's a great encouragement to those who get baptized. That's why we celebrate in this church family. Verse eight. So we have the first parable about the sheep. Next one, it says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? I want to point out a couple things. We see the, the first three things again in this one, but I want to point out a couple things. One is that the sheep was lost outside the home. The sheep was far away, had wandered off. Now we have a different picture of what Jesus is talking about. Now we have a woman who has lost a coin and it's a valuable coin that we're going to talk about in a second, but now it's inside the home. It's not somebody that's out there. It's somebody that's in here. And that's the picture of what Jesus is trying to say. There's different ways that you can be lost. So we're going to get to see another one uh, again next week as well in the third parable. But if we have this one. Now we have the owner. We have the object and then we have the operation. The owner is the woman. The object is the coin. And then the operation, it's an operation to rescue. Now, I want to point out something. First of all, when Jesus talked about a shepherd and compared himself to a shepherd, which is what he was doing, the shepherds in those days were not well respected. In fact, they were hated. They were the, kind of the lowest of the low. They were considered dirty and nasty. They weren't even allowed to come into spaces of worship and things like that because they were shepherds. And so when Jesus is saying this, they have a bad view of the shepherd from the start. But also now he says he's talking about himself and kind of comparing himself to a woman in this case who also was not respected or thought highly of. And Jesus is again, elevating these people and elevating. He's not, he's not degrading himself by saying he has the heart of a shepherd or the heart of this woman. But you need to understand the context of how he's bringing this up to them that they wouldn't have appreciated these analogies. They all understood them, but they wouldn't have appreciated them. So here's, the, here's what is important about the coin. The object that we have here is that when a woman got married at those times, everybody would have understood what these coins were. They were given 10 silver coins. They were drachmas. They were about a day's wage per coin. And uh, it's not necessarily that it has extreme amounts of value, but it still has value. It's kind of like if you have a wedding ring that's got a lot of diamonds on it or something. I don't have any diamonds on mine, but if you have a wedding ring that has a bunch of diamonds on it and one of them falls out, it might not be the most expensive diamond or anything like that, but it has this value to you that's really important. And that's the idea of what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's still valuable. You might say, well, you still have nine other coins. It's not that much money, but he's saying, you're going to do everything you can. This woman will search high and low. will bring out a lamp. will do everything she can for how long will she, will she search for it until she finds it. The same idea of what Jesus is saying, saying this coin is valued by the owner. The object is valued by the owner. You might not think it's worthy of all that effort. This is what Jesus is saying to both of them. You might not think that, but I do. The owner does. The shepherd understands the value. And this is what Jesus is saying, that it's lost from the owner. A coin, just like a sheep, is helpless without the owner. But there's an operation, the operation that set in place that I'm going to find this coin. I'm going to rescue this coin. I'm going to somehow bring it back to where it belongs. That's my goal. That's my desire because I value that coin. And then at the end, we have the ovation. Verse 9, it says, when she finds this, she calls her friends together and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing. There's an ovation in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I said this shepherd and this woman, they represent the Lord. We could have kind of boiled it down in both of them. There's a picture. There's first the, law, the Lord, then we have the lost, and then we see in the operation, the rescue, the search, the pursuit, we see the love. The Lord, the lost, and then the love, the love that caused him to pursue the one that was lost at all costs. Now, I want to ask a question. Why did Jesus tell these parables? 
These parables, if, if you remember, we read why he told these parables. What's the context of why he told, told these parables? Because you have to understand the context to really grasp what Jesus is trying to say. Here's the context again. I want to, some of you might have missed it early on. We're going to make sure we don't miss it right now. It says the tax collectors and sinners, the scum of the earth, the worst people you could possibly imagine, all the religious people like, we don't want anything to do with them. The tax collectors and the sinners, they are terrible, awful, outsider kind of people. They are people of the land. We are people of the law. We don't want anything to do with them. It says those people were all gathering around to hear Jesus. The sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's the context of why he's telling these parables. They're saying, I can't believe it. Why would he do that? Why would he spend time with these people, the outcasts, the sinners, the ones, they're not good enough for God. Why would he waste this time? We don't understand. I want to ask you a question. What was Jesus's purpose on this earth? Just think about it for a second. What was his purpose? Luke Chapter 19, Jesus told everybody his purpose. He said, the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's his purpose. He said, I came for this purpose to seek and to save that which was lost. So when they're asking him this question or they're muttering under their breath, they're like, this man eats with sinners. He welcomes sinners. What is wrong with him? He says, there's nothing wrong with me. This is why I came. You have to understand that's the heart of the father. That's the heart of Jesus to search out and to find the lost, to seek and to save the lost. Some people say, you know what, in this season of life, I'm just searching for God, trying to find out who God is. I'm searching for him right now. Here's what I want you to know. God is not lost. If you've ever said that, I want to remind you, God was never lost. We are the ones that are lost. He's not lost. You want to know where he is? He's right there searching for you, seeking after you, trailing behind you saying, I am right here. We are the ones that are lost. He's not lost. Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord has laid on him the guilt and the shame or the sin and iniquity of us all. All of us have strayed away. We've left God's path. We followed our own way. But because of his love and his grace, God said, I don't want you to be separated from me. So I'm going to come after you. I'm going to pursue you. And here's the way I'm going to do that. I'm going to send my son. And Jesus says, I came. I have a purpose that I was sent for. This purpose is to seek and to save the lost. You know how he did that? He died the death that you and I deserve to die because of our sin. We were separated from God. The wages of sin is death that we were separated. We deserve death. But he says, I don't want you to have to pay that price. I'm going to pay that price for you. And he died the death that we deserve to die so that we could be reconnected with God. It's the grace of God in Jesus Christ that we could be reconnected with him. That's why we sing a song like Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, blind, but now I see. We go from lost to found. No matter what's happened to you, I want you to know you might be lost But even when you're lost, your value is not lost. Just because you're lost, your value is not lost. I need you to understand that because that's the idea. The the sheep went away and you could say, you know what? I don't need that sheep. I'm good with the ones I have, but the father doesn't think that way. He says, I'm going after that sheep. That one has value. It's a lost sheep, but it's valuable to me. So I'm going after it. That coin is lost, but it's valuable to me. So I'm going after it. And the idea is that you and I were lost and he's chasing after us. There's some of you in the room today that you've been found. You've been found by Jesus. You've surrendered your life to him. You've already been rescued. Guess what? You get to be a part of the friends and family who get to celebrate when other people come in, but you have another job as well, and that is to have the heart of the Father, the heart of the Father to seek and to save that which was lost. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, what did he say to his disciples? He says, go and make disciples of all nations. He says, I'm about to go away. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to empower you, to fill you, to equip you, to do everything I've called you to do. But in the meantime, here's what you're going to do. When I leave, your job is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he says, and by the way, I'll be with you always. 
to the very end of the age. That's what Jesus said. That was the command. So here's the, here's the idea. I want, I want us to understand this. When it comes to the heart of the Father, I need you to understand that once you gave your life to Jesus, once you surrendered your life, you received that grace, if you were not immediately taken up to heaven, why would Jesus leave you here? Why would you be here? Does he want you to just struggle? Okay, well, now you're part of the family, but I'm just going to leave you to struggle and battle and fight through some of the things, deal with the flesh, battle with the flesh, deal with sickness and disease and all the other things, you know, heartbreak and all the things that go along with being and living on this earth. Why would he leave us here to do this, to be a part of what he's doing? He says, hey, I'm going. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, but here's what your job is, to go and make disciples to have the heart of the Father. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now I'm leaving you with a job. Now that I've found you, you have a job to do to go be a part of that as well. We talked about the Titanic about a year and a half ago. And it's good to be in the boat, to be in the rescue boat. But once you're in the boat, that's not enough because there's a lot of other people that are in the water that are dying and drowning. And guess what our job is? To go get them. That's our job, all of us to have the heart of the Father to say, you know what, I've been rescued, but now I'm on a rescue mission. That's a part of my job. That's a part of my journey. That's a part of my call as a follower of Jesus. If you've been found, you're supposed to go find the lost and help them be found as well. By the way, you will never be their savior, but you could be the one that takes the gospel to them. You could be the one that allows them to hear the gospel. You could be a part of somebody being saved. You don't save them, but you can be a part of it. What a blessing. By the way, if you feel like your faith has kind of stalled out, start doing this. Start seeking and saving. Start seeking out the lost so that Jesus can save the lost. Start trying to be a part of it. Say, God, would you just open my eyes to see the people that need to know you? I want to be a part of what you're doing in the lives of others. I'm telling you, this will change your spiritual life because you know what? Here's why it'll change. Because this is what you were here for. This is why you're still here. That's why we are still here. That's why all of us who are in Christ are still here to be a part of this rescue operation. He allows us to be a part of it. And when we miss it, that's why our faith has a tendency to stall out, to get stagnant, to get maybe a little boring. But when you're every day praying praying and saying, God, would you just help me to see people that need to know you? God, would you give me opportunities, open my eyes to see opportunities to share you with other people? Here's what starts to happen. You go, God, I, I need you. I'm a little bit nervous about this conversation right now. I need you right now. And here's what happens. Your faith begins to build because you say, God, I need you. And he says, I'm here. And I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the boldness to say it. I'll open your eyes to those opportunities. But you have to be willing to have the heart of the Father. You have to be willing to have the heart of the father, the heart of the shepherd, the heart of that woman to be a part of seeking and saving that which was lost. That's our job. But here's how this happens. So we asked why Jesus was hanging out with them. He, for what purpose? He was hanging out with them to rescue them because he loved them. But how does that happen? And I want us to understand this. This is how we'll finish. I need all of us to understand. How does that happen? How does somebody get rescued? Because Jesus says exactly how somebody gets rescued. And a lot of times we miss this, okay? Jesus is hanging out with the sinners and the lost people. And in our world today, especially right now, we talk a lot about words like affirmation and things like that. So does Jesus just say, you know, does it say that Jesus went to all these people who just was just like them and acted like them or affirmed them and stuff like that? Is that what, is that what we're supposed to do as followers of Jesus? Here's what it says. Jesus says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons. Verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It comes from repentance. That's how you and I are rescued is repentance. And I want to clarify this so that we have this understanding because there's a lot of people that live in Christian circles and stuff. And if you ask them, you know, when did you come to know God? They say, well, I've always been a Christian. I want you to know that statement is not a reality at all. That's impossible to always have been a follower of Jesus because the Bible says all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Not those, you know, it doesn't say, well, there's some that have always been with Jesus. It says all of us have left God's path to follow our own. So how do we get reconnected to the shepherd? This word repentance. 
You think about all the times that we see this, by the way, with Jesus, when he's talking to these people, the woman at the well, he's talking to this woman and they look and like, why is he talking to this woman, this Samaritan woman? Of course, because he values her, right? But what does he do? He says, hey, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And she's like, you're right. You've already had five. And the one you're with isn't even your husband now, right? And so he's saying these things. You're like, man, that's kind of harsh, right? But here's what he's doing. He's calling her up to something different. He's calling her to a different life, to repent of the life he's living. He wasn't judging her or condemning her. He was saying, I understand your predicament. I'm actually pointing out so you'll turn and go a different direction because I have water that will fill you up. I have living water to offer you. You've been looking in dry wells and I have something else, but you have to turn from that life to get it. The woman caught in adultery. They're wanting to stone her. Like, what do you say? He says, whoever's without sin, why don't you throw the first stone? They all walk away one at a time. By the way, Jesus was the one without sin who could have thrown the stone. But he says, where are your accusers? And she says, they're all gone. No one condemns me. And he says, I don't condemn you either. But go and sin no more. He's always calling repentance out of them. It's not, it's not an affirmation. It's a love that I'm constantly with them because I love them, but I still have a place to take them. And that can't go without repentance. If they don't surrender to me and allow themselves to be rescued by repentance, they're never going to experience that. And so today I just want to clarify that because if you say, you know what, I've always been a Christian, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever repented? Because you can't always have been a Christian. Because it takes repentance. And the way you do that is you first, you have to understand that you need to be rescued. You have to recognize that you need to be rescued. Once you recognize that you need to be rescued, you repent and say, you know what? I've been going this way. I've been going the wrong way. I need to be rescued. And because of what Jesus has done, I'm going to turn and go the other way. I'm going to live for him and I'm going to live with him. I'm going to surrender my life to him. And I'm, I want to be rescued by him. So I'm going to repent and then I'm going to receive the grace that he offers in his son, Jesus. And when you do that, here's what's amazing. When you choose to make that decision, your life will change forever and all of heaven will rejoice with you. 